Competitive Smash Bros has a long history of wrestling with rule sets. From wavering on wobbling, to indecisiveness on a Meta Knight ban in Brawl, to waiting 15 years before banning Hyrule Castle in Smash 64, the Smash community seems to perpetually be arguing about the rules. In this video, I will take a deep dive into the nature of rule sets and why Smash needs a rule set overhaul. I've split this video into four parts. Principles of competitive games, types of rule sets, practical examples, and finally, I will propose a new rule set. Why do we care so much about rules and why do we keep changing them? Why not just play the game as intended, so to speak? In order to tackle these questions, we need to establish some universal principles of competitive games. The first is this. Competitive games are a measure of skills that the game's players have determined to be laudable or worth measuring. We'll call these valued skills. This principle applies to all competitive games, not just esports. Chess measures positioning, calculation, and attacking and defending with your arsenal of pieces. Darts measures your ability to throw a dart at a board with both accuracy and precision. Baseball measures pitching, hitting, fielding, and running. It's tricky to nail down exactly what a game's valued skills are in so many words, but quite easy to say what a game's valued skills are not. In tennis, for example, rackets must adhere to certain size regulations. If a racket were 10 feet long, you would eliminate both positioning and agility as skills required to win. Instead, you could stand in the middle of the court and reach the ball from anywhere. That certainly would not be a valued skill. And this leads me to the next universal principle of competitive games. The rules of a game are set up in such a way that the valued skills are rewarded. In other words, rules are designed such that the valued skills are the best and most consistent ways to win a game. As the meta develops in any game, strategies change and the game begins to look different. In these cases, either the valued skills change at their roots, or the rules are modified in order to preserve the valued skills as the most viable path to victory. Which of these paths a game takes is arbitrary at the end of the day, but ultimately it comes down to what the game's players value. The shot clock in basketball is a common example of this, as it eliminates running away with the lead as a viable win condition. Instead, passing, positioning, shooting, and making plays are emphasized as the skills you need to win. Most sports have been around for so long that we don't think twice about their rules. We simply accept them as they have existed for decades. But with esports booming and new competitive titles coming out every year, it's important to discuss the nature of a rule set's development. Let's move into part two, types of rule sets. I want to explore the concept of a constructive rule set and a deconstructive rule set. At the inception of most sports, someone had a ball and decided that being able to throw it, kick it, toss it, or hit it in a certain way was impressive. From there, rules developed around those skills to eventually become the games we're familiar with today. These are constructive rule sets because they start with a valued skill, and additional skills are constructed around it to create a dynamic game. You could argue that most esports have constructive rule sets, but the rules are largely determined in the development phase by a game's designers. Street Fighter values footsies, Overwatch values mastering your character's mechanics and team coordination, Fortnite values adaptation and building forts. Virtually nothing changes between launching a game and starting a match because these games are constructively designed to be played in a competitive format. Smash, on the other hand, has developed a deconstructive rule set. Rather than starting with a concept of valued skills and building rules around that, Smash experiences a slow removal or alteration of game elements over the course of many years. Most of these elements are no-brainers. Intrusive stage hazards, items, and game-breaking glitches were banned very early on. But it gets trickier when we look at stalling and wobbling and timeouts. The tough part is that the idea of valued skills is actually quite nebulous. If you try to describe exactly what we value, you might find yourself tongue-tied. You could say we value good neutral game, but good luck coming up with an all-encompassing definition for that. You could say we value the ability to combo opponents, but some characters have a punish game that isn't quite combo-oriented as much as it is hit and run. It's actually easier to look at what we don't value and say, let's ban this and see what happens. And that's what we've done. Stalling has been declared illegal in Smash for many years, but has never been clearly defined in the rules. We've banned stages that enable circle camping, and we've set a 300% cap on wobbling, so clearly we don't value taking the lead and running out the clock as a win condition, but that still leaves a lot of room for interpretation on the no stalling clause. 
Huff can actually take the lead and use her aerial side B to run away from 90% of the cast, unchallenged, without going far off stage, and certainly without grabbing the ledge. Is that stalling? Does it matter that the characters this works against are mostly low tiers? Could you make the argument that our rule set intrinsically hurts low tiers? But aren't tiers determined by the rule set anyways because a tier list is contingent on the win conditions? We could go in circles on this, and herein lies the fundamental issue with a deconstructive rule set. Rather than starting with a set of criteria on valued skills, we let things play out until a skill we don't value comes to the forefront and we attempt to ban it. We are modifying the rules reactively rather than proactively. Any win condition that remains viable and not banned is tacitly endorsed by the rule set. And that brings me to part 3 of this video, practical examples. Smash Ultimate Majors all have a date after which the current version of the game is locked in. This is so players don't have to adapt to a new version of the game within a few days of an extremely important tournament. Turns out, this was extremely wise, because every major patch since the game's release has been launched just before a major tournament. None of these majors were played on the updated versions. Game developers that care about their game's competitive health should be mindful of this. When the core mechanics or win conditions of a game have changed, the rules in place may no longer be well suited. To make a change like this just before a tournament fundamentally changes the agreed upon version of the game in question. In Fortnite, for example, when a new item is introduced soon before a new tournament, you cannot compare it to inclement weather because it's not always as simple as adapting to an element in the game. It's a fundamental alteration to the game itself. It would be more like replacing a basketball with a volleyball. If one team wins after switching out the balls, is the winner still the superior basketball team? Are you even playing basketball at that point? Even minor changes fundamentally shift how a valued skill is manifested. If the Earth's density changed and gravity became stronger or weaker, do we care who would win a tennis match two weeks from now? No, because that game is no longer what tennis players have determined tennis to be. Of course games change over time, but ample time needs to pass for the game to stabilize before we can confidently say, this is still our game. Let's take wobbling as a case study. Defensive counterplay while being hit is a characteristic unique to Smash. It's called Directional Influence, or DI, and is performed by holding your analog stick in a certain direction to influence the trajectory your character is sent after being hit. There are many variations such as SDI and ASDI, but we'll keep it simple for now. You can utilize DI to avoid standard combos by holding away so that it's more difficult for moves to link together. On the other hand, as an aggressor, you have to mix up how you attack your opponent in order to counteract their DI. You do this by mixing in different moves, strong and weak hitboxes, and even your angle of attack. Concisely put, competitive Smash players value that each and every hit in melee is a two-sided interaction. This is where wobbling falls short. Defensive counterplay is one of the core mechanics valued by Smash players, and wobbling has absolutely zero counterplay once it begins. Even Puff's Rest can be DI'd, not to mention the fact that it's a very high risk move. Most highly rewarding punishes are offset by either high risk, high difficulty in execution, or both. The biggest risk with wobbling is missing a grab, and wobbling is extremely easy to perform. So where do we draw the line? Does it matter that ICs are only high tier and not top tier? Or is the only thing that matters that wobbling falls clearly outside the lines of what we value as competitive Smash players? Let's imagine a world where rather than slowly removing elements from a game that was not meant to be played competitively, we actually start from the ground up. A constructive rule set for Smash. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is in a stronger position than any other Smash game to make this a reality thanks to the huge selection of stages, rule customizations, and the ability to turn stage hazards off. This provides a perfect opportunity to build a constructive rule set because all the assets are there for us to leverage. Even in Melee, we just make do with what we have. Players tolerate random transformations and glitches on Pokemon Stadium, plus nuisances like wispy blowing wind and shy guys appearing off screen, not to mention the literal thousands of random platform combinations on Fountain of Dreams. In Ultimate, you have all of these stages and more, but in hazardless form. Unfortunately, most of the Smash Ultimate player base comes from Smash 4, so the opportunity is being squandered. This is why even now, stages like Town and City, which has moving platforms that take players all the way to the edge of the screen, aren't just considered legal, but are considered neutral. 
if we were to build a constructive rule set, then Ultimate could already be using a concise six-stage frozen stage list, rather than being weighed down by cumbersome ten-stage lists and a different counterpick procedure at every tournament. You could also use this approach to tackle the frankly appalling discourse over Hero's legality, in which neither side seems capable of making a coherent argument. Ask yourself, what skills do we value in Ultimate, and what can be considered a hindrance to those skills being the best and most consistent ways to win games? If you have difficulty winning in your main game against players who use it as a side hustle, then perhaps those valued skills include randomly accessing one-hit kill moves. If you value defensive counterplay or stage positioning or comboing or recovery, then you might not be okay with Magic Burst. In case you want to go even further in committing to a constructive rule set, you could set up high speed and low landing like spirits to increase the speed and combo potential in Ultimate. Many players have been experimenting with different spirit combinations to try and get the exact feel they want out of the game. Sakurai has provided all the tools, we just need to be willing to take the leap and make the game our own, but I digress. What I really want to discuss is this, an actual proposition for a constructive melee rule set. Let's move into the final part of this video. I could sit here and tell you we should have a 5 stage list of just Battlefield, Yoshi's, Dreamland, Fountain, and FD, or I could suggest we free Stadium and make FD a counterpick, I could suggest we ban Wobbling altogether to reward Ices for pulling off any number of their highly technical grab combos, I might even come up with blanket solutions to stalling with less subjective rulings, such as airtime limits and causing the opponent to lose a stock if you taunt four times in a row without taking damage. But this is just further deconstruction. Let's start from scratch. I have been carefully constructing a rule set from the ground up with feedback from several top players, and I'd like to introduce it to you now. It's called Rishi's Jungle Jam. Here are the rules. Stages, Congo Jungle. Stocks, 3. Timer, 8 minutes. Items, Starman, set to very low. Let's start with Congo Jungle. It's a narrow stage with two top platforms. The blast zones are all close to the edges of the stage. There is a barrel on a fixed timer beneath the main platform. There is a claptrap that attacks between the stage and the rock that you can see coming from the background ahead of time. There is a rock in the bottom right corner with a ledge on either side, which I will address shortly. A tall stage like this rewards high vertical mobility in order to navigate the tall platforms, and it mitigates the strength of high horizontal mobility. Camping off stage becomes extremely dangerous given the proximity to the blast zones. Camping the top platform is impossible because there are two so you have to commit to one or the other and risk being directly above your opponent. Between the stage proportions and platform positioning, this stage provides an elegant solution to many of the problems facing modern melee without resorting to difficult to enforce anti-stalling rules. The fact that you can pass through the main platform actually opens up a great deal of ledge options for characters that were previously limited. Peach notoriously has the worst ledge options of any high tier, but on Congo Jungle she can float through the ledge and stage, or even float to the barrel. The barrel serves as a mitigator for cheesy kills beneath the stage by characters camping the rock or ledge. Using the barrel as a retreat allows you to recover by either rocketing onto the stage, or take a risk by rocketing toward the rock and aiming for a tech. This is a 50-50 where the safer option can only be executed with good reaction time and precision. The rock is the most difficult stage element to reconcile, as it is very near the blast zone and has two ledges. Although the logs and claptraps help mitigate the use of degenerate tactics, I feel that a more proactive solution is required. That is why I have enabled the Starman item. Historically, items are banned because they spawn randomly and can be intrusions to the game. However, in Congo Jungle's case, the asymmetrical layout of the stage actually rewards players who prioritize controlling the main stage. When faced with a lame opponent who wants to force a risky mix-up on the rock, one can simply wait on the main stage for the inevitable Starman and use the invincibility to challenge the rock camper with no risk. This, again, encourages both players to continue playing interactively. Three stocks keeps matches fast-paced and exciting, and eight minutes allows a solid buffer to wait for a star if the opponent is camping. Otherwise, running the clock becomes too common. Therefore, camping the rock is not a viable win strategy in most cases. I would suggest every set be played as a best of five due to the fast-paced nature of the games in Rishi's Jungle Jam. In theory, games could take eight minutes each, but this is very unlikely thanks to the star man and small size of the stage. 
although the Starman can appear randomly, what I have found is that it tends to favor the player in the lead anyways, so long as neither player is camping. It also creates an interesting stage control dynamic. When a crate or capsule spawns, you can choose to either pursue a punish, buy for the item, or even feign going for the item and punishing your opponent for trying to get there first. In any case, the player that wins the aggressive interaction and hits the opponent away will get to seize the star. Thanks to the way the platforms work, items will often fall off the platforms and into the waterfall. This is yet another way in which the Starman becomes mostly relevant in camping scenarios rather than normal on-stage gameplay. Thank you, Congo Jungle. So far, I have had great success with Rishi's Jungle Jam, but the meta is still young. I encourage you to try playing degenerately and push the boundaries of the rule set. Experiment with some alterations and provide whatever feedback you have in the comments. Thanks to the constructive philosophy behind Rishi's Jungle Jam, there's a lot of flexibility. Also, wobbling is banned. Thanks for watching.